Okay, we are at Harvard Shelter and it's August the what? 15th. 15th. 16th, um, 2020. Spirit of Santa Paula has a long history in the community that you may not be aware of. And it kind of started in 1998 when there was a big development proposed up on the hill called Hillsboro. And it was, um, I think, 70 luxury homes. And there were going to be, oh my gosh, in the $600,000 range. And there was a lot of controversy about that project because it was designed for wealthy people and not for um, people who are not wealthy. And in Santa Paula, that's always been an issue, the haves and the have-nots. And so Howard and I were at our monthly potluck dinner with... 15 other couples and the subject came up about it's a good thing those homes are being built because that means we won't have any poor people living in that area and so I said something like well where do you want them to live and they said anywhere else and that so crushed me and I felt compelled to say something and I did and so Howard and I left and we sat in the car and I said, well, I guess that ends that. And I wonder who our friends will be. So we really lost relationship with those 15 couples. And I think some of you know that um, I've been the mayor here and president of the Boys and Girls Club and Chamber of Commerce and, and about anything you would want to do. And I had to completely separate myself from all of those relationships because the issue of homelessness was pretty ugly in Santa Paula. And in 2000 and 2000 and 2000, 2002, there was a land use ballot measure for Adams Canyon, 4,600 acres west of Pack, north of Foothill, that was going to be luxury homes again. Well, it went on the ballot and the measure lost and it was an ugly um, political battle, haves and the have-nots. And the community was extremely polarized. So there were six of us who were very troubled by what we were hearing. And it was me and Howard, Susan and John, who you know from here, and Bill Simmons and his wife, um, Linda. So we met in John and Susan's home and we said, we have to do something about this. And so we said, we're gonna pray about it and see what God would have us do. So it was about two minutes later, we had a um, neighborhood get together with about a hundred people at John and Susan's home. And I remember people were saying, okay, okay, you're getting ready to announce you're gonna run for something. And I, well, I was gonna say governor, but no, <laughs> not president. And so I was not, there was no agenda other than to see what God would do. So um, 2002, um, in February, we decided to form a corporation called Spirit of Santa Paula. And Spirit stands for Santa Paulans investing in relationships of integrity and trust. Spirit, that's what that means. So we kind of fooled around with it for six years, didn't know what to do, we met, talked, prayed, had a little Tuesday morning um, prayer group, and we were meeting in my office, which was at 123 North 10th Street, one Tuesday morning, when Bill Simmons came in, and he said, have you seen the television? We're being attacked. And I looked at him and thought there was something wrong with him, and he, we turned it on, of course, it was 911. Um, we were being attacked but the World Trade Center. So that really put in our hearts that we need to do something more for our community. So after that, we met and we had Fawn Parrish come and talk to us. She is a reconciler, international <laughs> reconciler. She takes groups that oppose each other, brings them together to work out some kind of compromise and resolution so that there's respect um, at the end of the meeting. And so she was talking to us about that because we saw in Santa Paula haves, have-nots, and largely it was the Mexican population and the Anglo population. There were some in both camps, 
but largely it was the two groups who were polarized. So as God would have it, on Christmas Eve 2008, you may not remember that time, but we were in economic chaos. People were losing their homes. The number of homeless people were increasing, living in their cars. And you know that I'm a chaplain with the fire department and there was a call to the little church on South 8th Street that a homeless man had died in one of the churches. And I was on that call and I said to myself, we have homeless people in our community that are sneaking into churches at night and one of them dies. Well, the pastor of the church was very angry at their janitor, who was Rudy Jimenez. Do some of you know Rudy? Um, Rudy had a key to the church and without permission, he was letting them in at night. And because it was very cold, Carolyn Lofton was in that group. Um, BB may have been in that group. I don't know, and I'm gonna ask him. Um, oh, Martine, who is Hope Mata's significant other. Lisa Mata may have been in that group. There was about eight of them. They were being sneaked into the church at night to stay warm and safe. Well, as God would have it, one of them dares to die. But that single event was what prompted all of this. And I said to myself, and I think it was the Holy Spirit saying, okay, you need to do something. Let's go. So that was Christmas Eve, remember? So the next day was Christmas. The next day was a Friday. I met with the director of Continuum of Care, the director of the, I never want to forget their names, Kate Mills, Kathy Bernicki, and Carol Shulkin, all involved with the County Homeless Services, and Pastor Dave McKeever, who is the pastor at Valley Community Church. I chose him because I knew where his heart would be. So we met on Friday and I said, we have to open a shelter. And they said, you have no idea what you're talking about. It's too hard, it takes too long. You've got to figure out how you can do something. So we started two weeks later with many meals. We were at the little church called the Lighthouse Church directly west of the um, city hall. And we had 47 people come. It was very cold, very rainy. And I will never forget standing inside the church watching them start to come towards us. We had put out flyers all along the walkways at uh, the government center, at Chino's Market, and where we knew they frequented. 47 people come. And I still have pictures on my old fashioned camera of that night. We served beef stew. Email was just coming in to its own at that time. So I sent an email out to my friends who had email. And um, I said, I need your help on next Wednesday night, please prepare beef stew for your family and make an extra dish for us. So they did, brought it to the church, we served beef stew, and that was the first of many meals. In 2010, we got so big that we moved to the Presbyterian Church. And we did not have a commercial kitchen there. And the county came in because somebody reported us and it, I don't know if I want to say for the record who it was, but it was business people on 10th Street. Uh, my office was at 123 North 10th Street and we, Bessie was with us back then. And we had the drop-in center there. And they were so mad seeing homeless people on 10th Street that they reported me to the city manager, the mayor, the director of building and safety, uh, fire department, police department, uh, county health. And so I was called to a meeting. Jaime Fontes was the manager then, and he was much more worried about what the Anglo population thought than people like me. And so he said, Kay, you can bring two people and they're gonna bring two people. And I thought, my gosh, it sounds like a tribunal is being formed. So I was very nervous. Um, I took Pastor 
Ron Urzua to that meeting and wow, I can't remember who else went with me to that. I was very fearful. And so we got into the meeting and Jaime Fontes said, okay, you start. And I said, this isn't my meeting, you start. And so the two people who were mad at us started, they accused, accused me of causing homelessness, of being the cause of the demise of the economic environment of Santa Paula, of um, disrespecting every business owner in the commercial district. It was pretty bad. And so we survived that. Oh, wow, I can't remember who else was there. Um, Ron Urzua called me the next day. He's my pastor. And he said, you know, I never knew that you had such power that you could cause the demise of the economic environment in the community of Santa Paula. Mm -hmm. And of course, that was kind of a joke, but it was a very serious time. I lost all my friends. They did not talk to me anymore. We had a couple of community meetings at a couple of churches, and I was the despised person in the room. And so I really had to suck that up because I felt very alone. And at that time, Howard was very sick. He um, had a condition called polymyalgia rheumatica, but we couldn't identify it. Fortunately, one of the nurses in the hospital identified it. Bless you. God bless you. So we got after that, but he, it was a very dark time economically. We were about to lose our house to foreclosure again. And my business was in disarray because the economy was so bad. And something very bad personally happened to me professionally. I had a group of friends turn on me and um, made my life very difficult for about a year. So, but through all of that, God took me through what I felt like was the valley of the shadow of death. And I didn't know how I was gonna survive it because I was so wounded. My well was so deep and it was so empty that um, I felt there was no hope. But slowly, the work that we were doing through many meals, I had been asked by the city if we would conduct a shelter for the fourth time at the um, Cultural Arts Building out at the um, community center. We had a very bad rain that year and there were flood warnings out and the community was very, or at least city officials were worried about the river people being stranded and being, you know, killed because they were expected very heavy rain. So we opened a shelter there. They saw our compassion. They saw our skill. They saw the relationship that we had with the homeless population who respected us. They appreciated us. They were well behaved. Were there drug addicts in the room? Yes. Were there alcoholics in the room? Absolutely. But there was always an incredible level of relationship between them and me and those who came around us. And so that was, um, I can't remember the year of that Every flood. Uh huh? Well, what, I'm trying to remember what year. It might have been 2015 when we had those flood warnings. And then, so in 2018, um, it was scheduled to be a very, very cold winter. And the church, the Methodist church at 118 North Mill was vacant because they had closed in June. This is all God again, just preparing the way for something great to happen. And so I went to the church at officials, not the local people. We had had a, um, um, we were using their facility for storage when we had the shelter at El Buen Pastor Church. And some bad things happened there. One of my supervisors was letting people in to sleep there at night without permission and they got caught twice and of course guess who that reflects on me um, that I'm not trustworthy because here were my supervisors letting people in instead of staying at the shelter she was letting them stay in the church so there was bad feelings towards us again 
And so I went to the church leadership in um, San Luis Obispo in Pasadena, and I said, how about letting us use your church for a shelter? They were very compassionate, and they said, absolutely. So we went to the city manager, who was then Michael Rock, and he said, you've got to be kidding. Absolutely no way. You got downtown business, you've got this and that. The people at the Glen Tavern were, were outraged. Um, I had a voicemail message from them that was very ugly, but guess what? We did it anyway. And, um, and the reason we got to do it is because we had the church set up like this, only it was without anything but a nice little rack, a blanket and a pillow. That's all you could see in the picture. When Michael Rock came in and saw how well organized we were, how much food was in the kitchen, and how we planned to do intake and um, interviewing people and running it, he reluctantly granted us a temporary use permit. And that was a very hard winter. We had some real problems there with people wanting to be the Lone Ranger and um, Oh, I hate to even name names, but uh, I'm not going to. Because um, some of them came over here when we were able to open here. So a woman moved into town about that time. Her name was Naomi Pitkern, and she bought a very expensive home out on South Mountain Road, paid about $1.2 million for it. She's from the Pitkern Glass Company in Philadelphia. Very, very wealthy and a real warrior. About 100 pounds, 5 feet Five maybe and um, hated God hated anything to do with God Christians must love Trump therefore Christians are no good but she got to know us particularly me and she got to know Susan some people who are Christians who um, are not warriors but will do what we have to do um, to protect people and she decided those Christians aren't so bad. So fast forward to Harvard Shelter. She had said to me, you know, if you ever see a good investment in a property, let me know, because I want to buy it. So we found this building, found it online, in foreclosure, bankruptcy, and um, a lot of problems here. But as God does things, in 2015, there was a fire here. And it was the old uh, Frontier Club, uh, it was Buck and Sonny's back in the day, and then it was El Gramo de Oro. And probably not a good, huh? Just like the Doris, it was a fast and stuff, and we got milk, so you know. It was and then they turned it to Miguel, and then oh, yeah? the fire, and then El Gramo de Oro. But it was, yeah, the Gramo de Oro. So I can imagine a lot of good things didn't happen here. Um, nightclub, who knows, but there was a fire here and it destroyed a lot of the buildings. So to reopen, they had to put in all new heating and air conditioning, all new roof, um, upgrade the bathrooms to handicapped bathrooms, put in a fairly good commercial kitchen, all the things that a homeless shelter needs. So we found the property and um, Naomi said, I'll buy it. I said, how about leasing it to Spirit of Santa Paula for a homeless shelter? She said, okay. She said, but no rent. So we had a lease agreement for 30 years to rent this building as a homeless shelter with no rent at all. And so we started the process back in June and upgrading, doing things that needed to be done. And lo and behold, in about September, she said, you know what? I'm just gonna give you the building. I don't want it. So we got a grant from the state of California to upgrade the commercial kitchen through Cal Recycle for food rescue. Uh, we got the grant for the two trucks and the passenger van. We um, got a grant to actually run the shelter. And so we put everything in one location, which meant we got to use the money for the commercial kitchen for food rescue for the shelter. You couldn't make up a story like that. So here we are today, um, right where we need to be. We plan to be in business for a long time. Think of what your life would be if we weren't here. And if all those things, bad things, hadn't happened, what now, 20 years ago? How old were you, Maria, 20 years ago? 26. 
26. David, how old were you 20 years ago? Um, were you alive? 16 years old, 20 years ago. Um, Shana, where were you 20 years ago? How old were you? 12. See? Who knew? Who knew except God, a good God, who has a plan for everybody's life, that we'd be here this day for you. And Gabriel. Gabriel wasn't even thought of back then. And here he is. So I wanted you to know the story. So when your well feels empty, know that God hasn't written the end of your story yet. He knows it, but he hasn't written it. And he's not going to tell you because he wants you to be faithful. And he wants you to trust him that he's going to fill your well at the right time in the right place and you're not going to have struggles like that anymore maria i know you spend many days feeling discouraged but you can't god has not written the rest of your story yet he's writing it as we speak letitia shirley betsy all of us we all have a story how could it be that i would see you sitting on a bench at bonds and I was trying to get you on the phone just five minutes earlier. And I walked up and I said, can I help you with something? And I was like, who are you? I was scared to death. Well, you said, yes, you can help me. I'm trying to find Kay. And I said, well. <laughs> Kay, Kathleen Kay. I'm like, see? Yeah. Life all goes on. So, rest of the story. And uh, where's Mary? Is she in the kitchen? Yeah. A year ago... Mary, Kitchen Mary, rescued you out of that house in Fillmore. You know that's the same person? Yeah. Yes, I was. I had a room over in Fillmore. I know. That was Mary who moved you out. Yeah, we well, had two guys came too. Shirley? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Remember? Your hair was a lot longer. Well, I had more. Yeah, I lost more. Yeah. But see, who knew that yeah. God would weave your path into yeah, here I am. I finally meet you. I just met you by phone. I know, but a year, more than a year ago. Yeah. 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 So there you are, the journey, the paths, they intersect at some point when God's ready to have that happen. So be patient, <coughs> trust him, and don't give up because I'm not going to. And we're exactly what you need right now. And God is too. He's going to be faithful. And he's going to see you through. So that's kind of my message today. I wanted to preserve this forever. And um, here we are, August the 15th, 16th, 2020.